Hello, my name is Dennis Murray and I'd like to welcome you to what we hope will be an interesting and educational hour. The goal of our program today is to introduce you to the Strong's Exhaustive Concordance of the Bible and also the Companion Bible and show you how to get started using these two books. We at Shepherd's Chapel believe the Bible is the holy written word of God. We believe in the prophecy, the history, and the covenants that the Bible holds. If you hold with these beliefs as well, we know you're going to enjoy this hour for we will guide you in the use of some tools and a blueprint which will greatly increase your understanding of God's Word. If you don't hold with these beliefs, we hope that you will stay with us and I pray that something I will say over the course of this hour will inspire you to pick up a Bible and find out that God's Word is alive and has significance in your life. You will never be truly happy or have the peace of mind that, the, that God's Word offers to you uh, unless you do. Regardless of your beliefs, we thank you for joining us today and welcome you to the program. I promise not to preach at you today, but rather teach you how to study God's Word in such a way that the Bible becomes God's interpreter to you. Uh, while the intent of the program today is to help new students, hopefully a few pointers that we'll go over today will help you Bible scholars as you're sharing your information with other new Bible students. Many of us would like to study God's Word more in depth, but we just don't know how or where to get started. We read the King James Version Bible and frankly we don't understand a lot of it. We tend to get bogged down in the words we don't understand, or worse yet, we think we understand what the Bible is saying in English when the true meaning that uh, from the original writings, which are Hebrew, Chaldee, and Greek, have been lost. Now few of us uh, speak Hebrew, Chaldee, or Greek fluently much less all three, but there is a way for you to build a lifetime of enjoyment studying God's Word in the original languages. But just as a carpenter would need tools and a blueprint to build a house, you also need tools and a blueprint to study God's Word as we do at Shepherd's Chapel, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, line by line. The two tools I would like to tell you about today are the Strong's Exhaustive Concordance of the Bible and the Companion Bible. The Strong's Exhaustive Concordance of the Bible, and by the way, a concordance is simply a book that lists all of the words that are contained in a book, in this case, the Bible. It's called the Exhaustive Concordance of the Bible because every word that is contained in the Bible and the passage where that word is utilized may be found. The main concordance, which makes up the first part of the Strong's Concordance, is found, of course, at the beginning of the book. Immediately following the main concordance, which we'll be going over here in a moment, will be an addenda and the addenda contains all of the words that have been found to be missing from the original works. The main concordance combined with the addenda is a very complete work. Following the addenda you will find an appendix and the appendix contains 47 unimportant words such as a, it, and the and these unimportant words are used so frequently throughout the Bible one would not even consider searching out a scripture based on their use. However, uh, every passage in the Bible that these words may be found is, is listed in abbreviated format. The second and third parts of the Strong's Exhaustive Concordance of the Bible are the Hebrew Chaldee Dictionary and the Greek Dictionary, respectively. As many of you know, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew or Chaldee and the New Testament was written in Greek. A reference number is assigned to each listing in the Greek Hebrew dictionaries and also is assigned to all the words that you find in the main concordance. So the English reader is easily able to match the English words with the foreign language with which it was written. At first glance, the Strong's Concordance might seem complicated, but believe me, it's simple as using a Webster's Dictionary. And once you've started using it, you will realize what a valuable tool you have at your fingertips. There are many uses of the Strong's Concordance. Uh, we will try to cover three today. The first, we will try to locate scriptures in the Bible when we're only able to remember a few key words. We'll call them leading words. We'll also learn how to use the Strong's Concordance where we may find words and phrases as they're found in other locations in the Bible. Uh, this is particularly helpful when you're preparing for a Sunday school lesson or uh, preparing a message. The last item that we'll cover on the Strong's Concordance today will be how to take the Hebrew, the English words in which the Bible is written, including proper nouns, back to their Hebrew, Chaldee, and Greek meanings in the dictionaries. 
So we'll take a few examples and those of you at home that have a Strong's Concordance, I invite you to take it out and we'll be working through these one exercise at a time. The first exercise that we're going to do today is to try and locate where in the Bible it says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And of course, the first thing you do when we're doing this is select a leading word. In this case, we're going to use the word pleased. And if we can go to the main concordance for those of you at home that do not have a listing. Okay. Now, we have selected the leading word pleased and uh, give you a little hint if you are looking for something in the Strong's Concordance. Of course, if it's a word that is used often, there are going to be a lot of occurrences. In this case, we were looking for the uh, scripture, Beloved Son, which indicates we're talking about Christ. And of course, you know that Christ was only mentioned in the New Testament. So in this case, when you're looking for pleased, uh, it would be good to go right to Matthew. And sure enough, the first listing in Matthew is verse 3, chapter 3, verse 17. Now in the main concordance, you'll notice that just enough words from the scripture are listed, in this case, beloved son in whom I am well pleased. You'll also note that the leading word is abbreviated to the first letter, and then it's followed by an inverted period. The number that follows the main concordance listing, in this case 2106, is the reference to the, in this case, the Greek dictionary and you may determine which dictionary, of course, by knowing, first of all, which uh, testament you're in, the Old or New Testament, but also the number, the reference number, if it is referred to the uh, Hebrew Chaldee Dictionary, this will be a Roman block numerals rather than the italicized as you see here. So let's check out and see if 317 in Matthew is actually the scripture we were looking for. And those of you that have a Bible at home, you're welcome to join us and read along with us here. And we're going to pick it up with Matthew 3.16 so that you get the general gist. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So we've successfully located the scripture that we are looking for. But let's follow this on through and let's go ahead and look and see what the Strong's Greek Dictionary has to say. And if you remember when we had our uh, main concordance up, we were referred to the Greek word 2106. And the Greek word 2106. And one thing I wanted to mention to you too, if you are ever looking in the Greek Hebrew dictionaries and the word that you find absolutely makes no sense, it would probably be a good idea to check up at the top and make sure you're in the right dictionary because that is a very common error when you're using the Strong's Concordance. Then we have on your monitor for you there at home, and to those of you that don't have a Strong's Concordance, the uh, Strong's Greek Hebrew Dictionary listing. And you'll see first the reference number 2106, and then the spelling uh, as it would be transliterated into the English, and then a phonetical pronunciation of how the word would be sounded out in the English language. In this case, eudokeo is the word, and it comes from the Greek word 2095 and 1380. Uh, don't let this throw you. It's simply a combination of two Greek words as in, in the English the word school bus is a combination of two words school and bus. Uh, following that we have an explanation of what the word means in the Greek to think well of, uh, an example to approve of an act, and specially to approbate which simply means to be satisfied with a person or thing. And then immediately following the meaning in the, he, the Greek, uh, you have a listing of the various ways that this word, eudokeo, has been translated into English in the King James Version Bible. Uh, it has been translated to think good or be well, to be pleased, uh, to please or be pleased, be the good or have take pleasure in, or be willing. So you see that uh, 
Uh, by the way, you can also use the English translations into the King James Version as a uh, minute, if you would, Greek or Hebrew concordance because if you take each of those translations back to your main concordance and then look for the reference number to match, you would have a listing of every word that, uh, everywhere that that Greek word was used in the New Testament. Okay, let's try another example. Uh, in this case, let's, uh, let's try and locate in the scriptures where it reads, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. In this case, we're going to select the leading word hallowed. And again, you'll see that uh, the Matthew is an abbreviation for Matthew there. Then this scripture may be found in ver chapter 6, verse 9 in heaven. In this case, you notice that the abbreviation of the leading word is capitalized, and that is due to the fact that as this word appears in this particular scripture, it is also capitalized. Uh, Hallowed be thy name, and then we have the reference to the Greek dictionary, word 37. So we'll check out the scripture and see if we've located the uh, verse that we're looking for. And chapter, we'll pick it up in chapter 6, verse 9 of the book of Matthew. And it reads, After this manner, therefore pray ye, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And if you recall in the main concordance, the leading word that we were using was hallowed. And in this case, we're going to go to the Greek dictionary, uh, word number 37. And again, those of you that have your strongs out at home, if you'll join me in turning there. And the Greek word for hallowed is hag iadzo. And again, you have a reference there. It's from Greek word 40. And this simply means that the root word from which this word hag iadzo was taken is word 40 in your Greek dictionary. So as you're studying in depth, of course, it would be good to go to word 40 and check it out further. But for the sake of time, we won't do that today. And it means to make holy, uh, i.e. an example, uh, and you'll see there it's uh, ceremonially. And in the, if you have your strongs out at home, you'll notice that this is ceremonially is abbreviated to CER. And if you have a problem keeping up with what the abbreviations mean, at both the front of the Hebrew dictionary and the Greek dictionary, you'll find a complete listing of what all the abbreviations symbolize. And ceremonially, this then is to purify or consecrate. Mentally, uh, to venerate, or this also could be mean to revere. And then again, you have all the ways that this particular word, hagiadzo, was translated into the English, and those are hallow, to be holy, and to sanctify. Now then, let's take an example or a problem that we want to locate where in the Bible, let's say we're preparing for a Sunday school class, and we want to locate where in the Bible we talk about Jonah being swallowed by the whale. So we're going to take the key word or leading word, Jonah, and try to find where in the Bible that we can figure out he was swallowed by the whale. So you'll notice on your monitor you have the leading word, Jonah. Uh, and this scripture, if you're looking down through the scriptures, and remember I said let's find where the whale is, you'll notice that in the book of Jonah there's no mention of a whale, but you do find a scripture that you think is what we're looking for, a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And again, it's capitalized because, of course, it's a proper noun and is capitalized in the scriptures. Now, this leads us then to Hebrew word 3124, but we're not going to go there at this point. I want us to go to Jonah 117 and see if we can figure out if this is where we're wanting to find our Sunday school lesson. And Jonah 1.17 reads, Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Now, a lot of folks would think, now why would Jonah be in the whale's belly for three days and three nights? 
Let's use old Jonah as an example of how we might go about searching the scriptures uh, for another occurrence of where the three days and three nights are mentioned and some mention possibly of Jonah so that we can add some meaning to this. And in this case, we'll go back to the main concordance and I want to go to Jonah. And uh, at this point, we're at the very first occurrence of the word Jonah in the main concordance. And you'll notice that this it's followed by the phonetical sounding as the word would sound in English and then also to see also Jonah and Jonas. Now you have to understand that the Bible was written in some cases two maybe three different languages and Jonas is simply the Greek translation of the name Jonah and what I'd like for you to understand here is that if you are looking for trying to tie in the Old Testament and New Testament, it's very important for you to recognize that possibly the name is a little bit different from the Old to the New, and that is simply due to the Hebrew and Greek. But then if we go on down in Jonas in the main concordance, And we find by looking at the uh, center column, which contains a few words of the scriptures, Matthew 1240. And it reads as Jonas was three days and three nights. And in this case, I'd also like to point out to you that the asterisk preceding the, ref the dictionary reference number uh, simply means that this particular word has been translated differently in the revised edition of the Bible than it was in the original authorized King James Version of 1611. Now if you see a single obelisk, which is a similar symbol to a cross in this position, it means that the British revisers have translated this word differently than the 1611 Bible has. And if you have a double obelisk, uh, it means that the American revisers have translated this word differently than the 1611 King James. So let's go to Matthew 12, 40, and we're going to see if we can figure out why Jonas might have been in that fish's belly for three days and three nights. And Matthew 12, 40, and let's pick it up actually with verse 38. And Matthew chapter 12, verse 38 reads, Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, and they're talking to Christ, Master, we would see a sign from thee. They were asking for some uh, sign to show them that he was actually the Son of God. And then in verse 39 it reads, But he answered, Christ speaking, and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. You want a sign, and, and you don't even know what the, who I am standing here before you. And there shall no sign be given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas, or Jonah. And then verse 40, we'll pick it up there. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. As Paul taught us in 1 Corinthians 10, everything written in the Old Testament is an example to us of what things would come in the New Testament and how things would be. Uh, don't let anyone tell you that it's not important to study the Old Testament of the Bible. Uh, the prophecies are being fulfilled very rapidly at this time and many of the prophecies in the Bible have not yet been fulfilled. And friends, that's tomorrow's newspaper headlines. Let's take another example of how we can use the Strong's to add meaning to, the, to different scriptures, especially ones that we have questions about. Uh, one that comes to mind, we read of Christ on the cross at one point in the Bible saying, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And this might trouble some that Christ would uh, have a seemingly weak moment. And let's go to the main concordance and we're going to take the uh, leading word forsaken in this case. And we'll find in Matthew 27, 46 is a location that this has uh, uh, been written of and the scripture, uh, the portion of the scripture, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And this leads us then to the Greek word 1459. But in this case, we're not going to go to the Greek dictionary at this point. Um, let's go to Matthew 27, 46 
and we'll take a look and see if, if this is actually where we want to be studying. And 2746 reads, And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried. Now remember, this is Christ on the cross. And the fact is, these are the last words that Christ spoke. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now, could there be something in the Old Testament that might add meaning and clarify why Christ would say this on the cross? And if we'll go back to your main concordance and to your lead word forsaken, we find in the Old Testament a reference to Psalms 22.1. And this reads, My God, why hast thou forsaken me? Identical. In this case, of course, you'll note that you have Roman numerals. The number 5800 would be the Hebrew word for forsaken. But let's go to Psalms 22.1 and see if some meaning can be added to what it is we've read here. And Psalms 22.1 reads, and this is a psalm of David, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? If you'll read on in uh, book, the, uh, chapter 22 of Psalms, uh, which is a prophecy of God written of David, you'll read about the coming and crucifixion of Christ our Lord and Savior, uh, down to the piercing of His hands and His feet with nails, uh, down to the casting of lots for His garments, and even to the point of describing how uh, one would give Him vinegar when He was thirsty. You see, uh, everything in the New Testament is written as an example, uh, or an example, to us of what is to come. Uh, use your Strong's Concordance in this way, especially when you find words or phrases that don't make sense, and a lot of times you will find something that ties in that adds a lot of value and meaning. Okay, there's another verse in the Bible that uh, often uh, seems to contradict itself and confuse people, and that's Luke 14.26. And I would like for you to turn with me to Luke 14.26. And Christ is teaching the disciples, and he says to them, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And this to most would seem to contradict uh, what was written to us in Exodus where the uh, Ten Commandments were given to us that we should honor our mother and father. But Christ is saying in this case, uh, if you don't hate your father and mother. But let's check this out in the Strong's uh, uh, main concordance. And we'll take the leading word hate in that this is the word that we wish to take back to the original language to see if we can add some meaning to this. And we find Luke 14, 26, and hate not his father and mother. And then you again have the asterisk, and I remind you the asterisk simply means that this word has been translated differently in the revised version of the Bible of 1885 than it was in the 1611. But let's go to the, this Greek word 3404 and see if we can add some meaning to why Christ would say such a thing that seems to contradict. So we're going to... 3404, and the Greek word is mis -ao. and you have it there, those of you that don't have a Strong's at home, and it's from the prime misos, and again, this is just the prime word from which misio uh, is derived, and it means to detest, especially to persecute by extension, now catch this, sharpen up, by extension to love less. And then the words, the way, the only way this has been translated is hate or hateful and nothing about love less. So if we go back and read Luke 14, 26 again, but replacing the hate with love less, if any man come to me and hate not his father, or actually, and loves less, not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. 
So I'm, I don't know about you, but I'm a lot more comfortable reading uh, the scripture this way and, and this is how you can use your strongs to add meaning, especially when the Bible even seems to contradict itself. Let's get a little more practice using the strongs uh, to translate uh, proper nouns. Let's, let's take a few names and yes, all the names, proper nouns and the names of cities and regions are contained in the strongs so that you can easily take them back to the original language. In this case, we're going to choose old uh, Noah. Let's choose Noah and go back to the main concordance. And uh, the first appearance of Noah in the Bible is in Genesis 5.29. He called his name Noah, saying, and again, it's capitalized because that's a proper noun and that's the way it appears. Okay, then we're going to go to the he uh, Hebrew word 5146, and we'll see that that is Noach. And that's how it's pronounced in the English. The same as 5118. And again, if you were doing a deeper study into this, you always want to go and check out the same as or any time that you're referred to another location. And the name Noak in Hebrew means to rest. And it was translated Noak, the patriarch of the flood, of course, as we all know. And it was translated in the King James Version as Noah. Now then, though, if we go back to our main concordance and if we search down the right-hand column looking at the reference numbers to the Hebrew dictionary, uh, we find that there's another uh, number, 5270, and this uh, is found in Numbers 2633. And what my point here is that sometimes the Strong's will help you differentiate between people. And let's go to the uh, Strong's uh, Dictionary Hebrew for word 5270 and see if we can add some clarification to another Noah that appears in the Bible. And the Strong's we have word 5270 and it's pronounced in the Hebrew Noah and this is from word 5128. And in this case the word means movement. It was translated Noah an Israelite Tess, and it's translated in the King James Version, Noah, D-I, Noah. An Israelite Tess, that's right, and a woman. And uh, I, I didn't know until I got into preparing for this program that there was a female by the name of Noah in the Bible. So if we go to the book of Numbers, and our reference is chapter 26, verse 33, and it reads, and Zelophehad, the son of Hefer, had no sons but daughters. And the names of the daughters of Zelophehad were Mela and Noah, Hogla, Milcah, and Tirzah. So, you can see the Strong's has helped us differentiate between these two Noahs that appear in the Bible. But I'm also going to give you an example where the Strong's won't help you out differentiate between people and there's nothing like good old-fashioned homework and Bible study to help you distinguish. Let's take Jeremiah and let's go to the uh, main concordance and we'll look up the word Jeremiah. And we look down the right hand column uh, if you have a Strong's at home and you'll notice every time this word appears in the Old Testament it is the Hebrew word 3414, Jeremiah. Uh, this particular reference we're looking at is 2 Kings 23:31. So let's go to the uh, Hebrew dictionary 3414 and we'll see if that will add any light to Jeremiah's that are found in the Bible. And, and we have that on your monitor there and it's Strong's 3414 and it's pronounced in the English Yermeya or Yermeyahu. And it comes from the words 7311 and 3050, both in the Hebrew. And it means Yah will rise. And most of you know that Yah, of course, is a, a Hebrew name for our Heavenly Father. Uh, Jeremiah is how it was pronounced. The name uh, of eight or nine Israelites. And the only way that it has been translated into the King James Version Bible is Jeremiah. So let's turn to the book of Jeremiah. And Try and give you an example of how just a little bit of homework sometimes will help you keep your Jeremiah straight. And Jeremiah 1 1 is where we're going. And it reads The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priest that were in Anathoth, in the land of Benjamin. 
And it continues on in the second verse, to whom the word of the Lord came. So obviously this is Jeremiah the prophet, but I want you to remember that he is the son of Hilkiah. So let's turn to Jeremiah 35, 3, and we'll learn of another Jeremiah, even in the book of Jeremiah. And my point here is that it's important to keep your genealogy straight so that you know for sure which subject you're talking about. And we'll pick it up there then in 35, 3. Then I took Jezaniah, the son of Jeremiah, here's our other Jeremiah, the son of Habazaniah, and his brethren, and all his sons, and the whole house of the Rechabites. And if we could hold that on the screen, please. Uh, so you see we have two different Jeremiahs, but I'd like for you to take on just as a home assignment, the Rechabites. Uh, use your Strong's Concordance, and if you have a companion Bible, and take on the project of determining who were these Rechabites. Well, that is about to wrap up our portion on the Strong's. I hope you're beginning to see what a valuable study tool the Strong's Concordance is to the serious Bible student. Um, we have the Strong's Concordance and the Greek Hebrew dictionaries available on some of the PC Bible software programs available at the chapel. Uh, if you have a home computer, these are excellent study tools and are, are very fast. Uh, I use them at home myself and study, but it's also once a week make myself pull out the old hard copy of the Strong's and study with it so that you don't lose practice on how to use it. Again, the next part of our program, we'll be talking about the Companion Bible, a valuable tool and a blueprint to studying God's Word. I uh, hope you'll stay with us and listen to this message, won't you please? The Strong's Exhaustive Concordance of the Bible is an invaluable tool to the serious Bible student. The Strong's Concordance lists every word used in the Bible and every passage where the word utilized may be found in the scriptures. With the assistance of a reference numbering system, the English reader may easily translate any word back to the original Hebrew, Chaldee, or Greek in which God's word was written. The Companion Bible is a unique study Bible. In addition to the text of the King James Version Bible, an extra wide margin contains a wealth of information not found in other Bibles. A system of structures or outlines employed by the Companion Bible will allow the readers to rightly divide the Bible. The use of these structures help the reader follow the subject matter and therefore they are critical to an understanding of God's Word. The 198 appendixes found in the Bible cover a wide variety of topics and information which will enlighten your studies. The Companion Bible and Strongest Concordance are a must for the serious Bible student. All right, there we are back again. In this segment, we're going to be covering uh, the, another tool and a blueprint that you can use in studying God's